Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much just for this opportunity to bring your word today. Father, I pray that you uh, speak today. Lord, I pray that you have your way in our hearts. God, use me as a vessel, Lord God, today. Lord God, help us to hear your word and do your word. Lord God, be our vision. Give new hearts today so they can see the gospel and hear the gospel. Lord God, and bless your church, Lord God, to love each other and to love this world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Turn with me to Luke chapter 17. Luke 17. Verse 1 through 4, Luke 17, 1 through 4. When you got it, say amen. amen. Let me know that you're with me and stand as we read God's word together. Luke 17, 1 through 4. And it reads, And he said to his disciples, Temptation to sin are sure to come, but woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were cast into the sea than he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention. Someone say, pay attention. Pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times and says, I repent, you must forgive him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Love, it's your responsibility, Christian. <laughs> so, has anyone been summoned to jury duty before? <laughs> Raise your hand. Yes. Yes. Okay. Jury duty. Oh, man. Um, I, I, I was summoned way, 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 way back. And um, I went... I was just like, you know, what's going on? I don't know what I'm, what I'm doing here. I don't know what, you know, they put my name in the, the thing. They spun the wheel. My number didn't come out. Praise the Lord. My, my wife was summoned a few months ago. Um, and I had to ask her this week, sweetheart, did, did you answer the summons? <laughs> and she did. So thank God for that. Um, but jury duty, it's, it's, it's a responsibility. It's not optional. Um, it's not, hey, if you think about coming to court, you can come to court. No, it's, it's a responsibility. Uh, it's, a, it's a duty that we have as citizens of the United States and the state of Virginia, right? Just like taxes. You have to pay taxes. That's not optional, unless you want to spend time in the in 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 joint. <laughs> School, just like students, you have responsibilities. You have stuff to do for the teachers, or you'll fail. Amen? Amen. Right, right, right. I hope y'all doing good. <laughs> Employees at work, you have responsibilities at work. If you don't do them, you may get the door <laughs> and say, hey, I'll send you that last check in the mail. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we have responsibilities. We have duties. We have summons to follow as followers of Christ. And in the scripture today, uh, we're going to see love. It's our responsibility, Christian. It's our responsibility. So back, we're back in the book of Luke. Uh, Elder Rick did an amazing job last week um, talking about the rich man and Lazarus um, and the, the horrors of hell. Um, and this, this, the scene hasn't changed. Jesus and his entourage... The disciples, scribes, Pharisees, the tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, they were following him as he was teaching these things. Now, the standard back in those days was you, you invite the cool kids over, the spiritual elite over, or the social elite over, and they can return the favor. Um, but Jesus, was, he flipped the script, like, like Ben talked about, how he, he flipped it upside down, how he 
welcomed the least, the lost, and those who are sick. And he showed them a new way, a way of hos hospitality, generosity, self-sacrifice. That's the, the new way. With that in mind, Jesus had finished telling a rather haunting story about the rich man and Lazarus in, in uh, Luke 16 and the fate of those who don't have trust and faith in Jesus and hell. And he says here, he said to his disciples, so again, the entourage follow him, disciples, Pharisees, scribes, tax collectors, sinners. But now he turns to his disciples and says, temptations to sin are sure to come. Through the account last week, um, we've seen that Lazarus and, and the rich man, Lazarus wanted his brothers to come back and warn. He wanted to go back and warn them that the place that you don't have, if you don't have faith in the Messiah or God, you will be in torment forever. And Jesus is showing them on this side of eternity, in the land of the living, this is what matters the most. So everyone's listening here, and Jesus says, temptations are sure to come. Temptations are sure to come. So we live in this sin-filled world. We, we battle the devil daily. We battle this world daily. We battle the flesh daily. Temptations to sin are sure to come. When, we're, when we just become new, new Christians, we're like, oh man, this is going to be great. I'm no longer going to sin. What? <laughs> Jesus said, it's sure to come. This is a serious warning. He warns them that it's inevitable. The phrase here is emphatic. It was a strong warning. He, Jesus simply could have said temptations or stumbling blocks would come, but he puts an even more stronger emphasis on it. It's impossible that stumbling blocks not come. It is impossible for causes of stumbling not to come. And as it's translated here in the ESV, temptations to sin are surely to come. This is a serious warning Amen. because it's certain to happen. We can count on it. Stumbling blocks will continually come to trip up the follower of Christ. Again, we have three enemies persistent daily. This world that's against God, the devil that hates you, and your flesh that you live in. They're, they're sure to come. It's impossible. It's inevitable that you'll be offended. But, but Jesus says, woe to him. Woe to the person through whom these offenses come. It is important to, for us to understand he speaks of offenses or temptations to sin or stumbling blocks. Uh, where we, in the Greek, it's scandalon, where we get our word scandalous or scandal. I was watching uh, Wally Coyote yesterday with Nehemiah. And um, anybody saw that show before? Wally Coyote, Roadrunner? Meet, meet. Remember that? Wally Coyote would always set up these scandalon to try to catch Roadrunner. Meet, meet. He would always set up these, these traps where, and, and the word scandalon here is, is where it's, it's like a, anybody, you know, trap animals, hunters in here? I don't know who is. If you are, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So you would put a bait somewhere and you would watch the animal come to the bait and they would step in the trap and as soon as they step on the bait or catch the bait it would it would catch them Wally Cowley did that all the time did he catch Roadrunner no <laughs> meet me he didn't catch him that's right he was too fast that's right son he was too fast and the word here scandalon bent stick a stick that springs the trap it sets the bait. It was also used as a stumbling block. Someone would trip over. It's a stumbling block, a cause of sin, to temp a temptation, a rock that would be held up by a box. Again, it's like a mousetrap. The mice would come, get the cheese, sack. <laughs> Again, Wiley Coyote did not catch a roadrunner. Meep, meep. But Jesus said, temptations to sin are sure to come. In the Bible, you'll see the word scandalon all over the place. Um, but it's used in a good, a good way to reference Jesus. 
Because the world, they trip over Jesus. They trip over the gospel. They're offended by the gospel in Romans 9, uh, 33, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, and Galatians 5, 11. It's a, a stone of stumbling to those who don't believe. It's a good thing, but in the, in the church, it's a bad thing. It could be a false witness, a false counsel that we give to one another. Matthew 16, when Jesus called Peter a devil, Jesus said, I'm going to die. Peter said, no, you're not. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance, again, stumbling block for me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on things of men. Another way we can be a, a stumbling block or to, a cause for sin for another brother and sister is using our liberty. It might be, it might, it might be beneficial to us, or we, we may be okay with it, but it may cause another brother or sister to sin. In Romans 14, 13, it can be leading a brother into sin by using our liberty. Or also, division, false teaching. Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles, again, stumbling blocks, in the way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them. And Jesus here at the end of verse 1 says, Woe to the one through whom they come. Jesus says here, People are going to take the bait, but woe to you if you offer the hook. People are going to trip you up, but woe to you if you set the stumbling block in their way. It will be better for the offending one to die a horrible death, such as having a, a millstone that's like a, a hundred pound or more than hundred of pounds stone that they would use back in the day to uh, crush the grain. And they, a donkey would have to pull that stone. And Jesus is saying, woe to you. It will be better for you to die a horrible death than to tempt one of these little ones to sin. Like having a car engine hung around your neck and just being thrown to the ocean. You're not coming up from that. It's not, it's not possible that stumbling blocks will not come. Temptation to sin is inevitable. Those who seek to entice you to spiritual and moral failure are, are unavoidable. The danger is serious. And Jesus pronounces the serious warnings against those who cause the temptations to come. Woe to him through whom they come. A woe is a strong interjection expressing the grief and denunciation here. It's, it's saying danger coming. It's bad, it's, it, would be, it would be better for a millstone to be hung around the neck than you would cause one of these little ones to sin. And commentators said the little ones that they're talking about here is a new believer. Yes, this could be a child, but it's talking about a new believer. Again, remember the context. Remember where we're coming from. There's a lot of new, new followers of Christ here listening to these stories. And the, the Pharisees are there too. And he says, woe to you. Cause one of these little ones, one of these newer believers, these tax collectors or sinners, to, to turn away from me. Woe to you. And these warnings will be given to the Pharisees and the lawyers who were present because of their religious hypocrisy. It was obvious they were stumbling others and certainly the context here includes them in the warning. Maybe it was a, a false religion or a false leader of a cult. It was blatantly obvious to those who were, uh, were open to rebellion against God and those who caused sin. But he, he was talking to the disciples. So those people are blatant. The Pharisees, Sadducees, they were, they were blatant, causing people to not follow the Lord. But he's talking to his disciples. It's a warning for his followers. Why, why, would he, why would he do this? In John 6 and John 8, those who were supposedly to follow him, they would no longer walk with him. They rejected him. They believed in him, but then they rejected him. Just because someone claimed to believe in Jesus doesn't mean they will continue to follow him. Remember Judas. He was one of the twelve. Paul warned the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 
Verse 29, he says, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come from among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them, from among them. Christians, let's examine ourselves. Let's examine ourselves. Are we causing fellow Christians to sin or tempting them to fall away from Christ? How are we speaking? What are we doing by not or not doing and not listening to God? Think about your life. How are you causing others to sin? Praise God for his blood. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his blood. We can confess and be cleansed. But this warning is necessary over over the history of the church. I mean, now we have a lot of false teaching going around. TV, media, YouTube, a lot of false teaching going around. And it, it may look like these people are pious and following after God. But if you really read your Bible, they're teaching false things. And that's from within the body. I mean, we have blatant, blatant just against God and Again, Jesus is talking to everyone. So we have other religions that are false that could lead new, a new follower away from the Lord. Jehovah's Witness, Mormons, Muslims, Hebrew Israelites, the New Age, just Christian science. Like all of these things for a new follower, if they're really not in the word or being discipled, it can lead them astray. But again, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And remember, we are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone for the glory of God alone. Amen? Amen. So again, we don't want to cause our little ones to fall away and stumble. So what is the solution? 1 John chapter 2, verse 10 explains the solution to not be a, a scandal for one of these little ones. Love, again, love is our responsibility. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. And if we love a brother, we will not bring an offense into his life. So love is our responsibility. We're not going to cause one of our fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord to sin. We're not going to cause them to stumble in sin. In verse 3, pay attention to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. Be on guard. Reminds me of the 80s and 90s theologian Michael Jackson. I'm starting with the man in the mirror. <laughs> I'm asking him to change his ways. No message could have been any clearer. If you want to make the world a better place, take a look at yourself and make a change. Na 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 na. Start with the man in the mirror. Pay attention to yourself. Take heed. Be on guard. But it says pay attention to yourselves. So it's not just an individual thing. Again, we're a body. We're a body. It's a, it's a collective thing. Pay attention to ourselves, church. We don't want to cause one of these little ones to sin. Be on guard. Be aware and ready. Stumbling blocks will, put, will be put before you. But be aware. Be alert. Temptations will come. Be careful to follow the commands of Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles you. Run with endurance the race that is set before you, fixing your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith, considering his example so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen? Remember, remember as well, temptations will come. But 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. In regards to others, be ready to take action when they stumble in sin. And this begins with a rebuke and continues with forgiveness. Pay attention to yourselves. Temptations to sin will come. Be on guard. Pay attention. Scandalon is going to be right in front of you. It's 
going to be right in front of you. But God is faithful. He will provide a way of escape. Just like the roadrunner. Meep, meep. You can't escape. But now he changes, changes direction here. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. When someone sins against you, you're not to pretend it never happened. You need to rebuke that brother or sister in love. Rebuke is a, a strong disapproval. It, it carries the idea of finding fault or blame or reprimanding. Put in this context, it, 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 it's done by a brother. It's done by a fellow Christian. So rebuke, this is to be strong but not harsh. It's to find fault or warning but not condemning. It's to carry out various commands of Scripture, to be discerning, to recognize sin in one another so that it's a, a point of restoration, not of putting you down. In, in Matthew 7, the command is to take the log, take the tree out of your eye first, so you can take the four by four out of your brother and sister's eye. In, in Matthew 18, like Elder Rick read earlier, the escalation of rebuke and confrontation is out of the motive of love and restoration. And it's also protecting, if the more and more escalation of that sin is protecting the body, it's to restore a sinning brother or sister back into the fold. In Galatians 6, it is to be done for the purpose of restoration with the spirit of gentleness and to bear the burden of the one who has been caught in a trespass. Again, love is the rule here. We obviously can't go around keeping record of each and every one of our sins. One aspect of the fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering. We need to suffer long and bear the burdens of one another. Ephesians 4.2 says that we should be loved with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love. Again, love is our responsibility. Ephesians 4.15, as a pattern, we need to speak the truth in love. Love is not going around telling other people about it. Love is not bottling it up inside of us. Love is getting it straight with that person who sinned against you. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. This is a challenge from Jesus. There is no option given. When the person who offended you repents, you must forgive him. This wasn't a suggestion like jury duty. It wasn't a suggestion. It's a command. Forgiven people forgive. Amen? Amen. Forgiveness is to be granted to those who repent. This is specifically speaking in reference to the person that has uh, made against you their sin. Since all sin is primarily against the Lord and his commands, God can forgive that person of their sins ultimately and save them from eternal punishment. Just like he did in that story that uh, Rick preached last week. Jesus, the Son of God, the God-man, the Messiah, became a man, lived a sinless life, then voluntarily died on the cross and became a substitutionary sacrifice for those who would believe. His resurrection proved that his sacrifice was sufficient and it proved that his promises are true. His price of redemption is applied to all those who put their faith in in him. And they are forgiven and adopted into God's family. But again, you can't believe in Jesus without repentance of sin. In a, in a similar manner, human relationships can't be made right until there's repentance. Yes, love covers a multitude of sin. But, and it, it reflects God's tolerance and patience and long sufferings. It reflects that. But human relationships can't overlook the, the sin that's against us. These sins will cause disruptions in relationships. But on the repentance, we can grant forgiveness to those who sin against us. Christians are to forgive the same way that God forgave us. Any sin that's against us, we can forgive. And it, you might be thinking, man, Daryl, you don't know what they did. I don't. 
but you can forgive them through the power of God in you, Christian. If you follow Jesus, you can forgive them because you're forgiven completely and wholly by Jesus Christ. They repent, we forgive. He says, if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. Jesus forgave us of a lot. A whole lot. Lying, disobedience to parents, lust, covetousness, idolatry, our evil thoughts. He forgave us of everything. We can forgive a, a brother and sister in the Lord, but we can also forgive those that outside the church that sin against us because we've been sinned against. Anybody in here have been sinned against? Yes, yes, every one of us have. And we can forgive because the Lord has forgiven us. It will be hard, amen? It will be hard, but we can do it. Remember, Jesus forgave you completely of all sin, past, present, and future. We seek God's grace as we practice biblical principles in our relationships. We practice what God says, and then we are amazed at the relationships being stronger than before. We love God more because he's forgiven us. And the same could be true for those in and around us every day. Loving others and caring for their souls and encouraging their repentance. We're not causing a stumbling block to others by sinning against them or causing them to sin. But when we are sinned against, we're not to be roadblocks to their repentance. But help them to repent, confronting them, rebuking them in love because we care for their souls and the glory of God. But in verse 4, and if he sins against you seven times in a day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. That's, whoa, Lord. If someone comes to me and sins against me and says, Daryl, I'm sorry, I, I, please forgive me, I'm wrong. I'm to forgive them. Cool, understand. Do it again. Daryl, I'm sorry. <laughs> forgive me. I'm wrong. Okay, I forgive you. Seven times in a day? <laughs> like, really, Lord? Help me. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Seven times in a day. Like, whoa. Jesus is not an option. He says, forgive them. Forgive them. And like Elder Rick read earlier, Peter asked the Lord, how many, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Because back in the, the Jewish times, they, it was basically three strikes and you're out. I can forgive him three times. So Peter's like, okay, okay, no problem. Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? He, he you know, times two plus one. Seven times, you know, seven number of completion, you know. The Lord says, no, 70 Times seven. What? Lord, wait, hold up, hold up. Wait a minute. You want me to forgive my brother that many times? But you, Lord, you don't know what they did. Peter, Daryl, church, we don't know what we did against the Lord. Like, he wants us to forgive people. It may be hard. yes. But those that follow Christ, we have the Spirit of God in us to help us to forgive and to bring restoration. I'm sitting right down there with my wife. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself, too. And we need to forgive, church. We can't walk around with bitterness and anger in our hearts. We need to forgive. The million-dollar question is, will you forgive today? Is there someone you need to call after church and say, you need to confess to them? You, you, you're the one that may need to repent. Or you're the one that may need to forgive. There may be somebody at the church, you have to text, call, and say, I forgive you, brother, sister, I forgive you. Or you may be the one that has to repent and say, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Help me. Let's restore this relationship. Because the Lord's forgiven me of so much. What if he didn't forgive you? <laughs> what if he didn't forgive you? Like Rick talked about last week, 
the wicked will go to hell. It's a real place. Jesus talked about it so many times in the Gospels. It's unquenchable fire. It's a place of darkness. Shame and everlasting contempt. Torment, everlasting destruction. A place where the smoke of their torment raises forever and ever. A lake of burning sulfur. Complete separation from God forever. If the Lord did not forgive you, saint, that's where you would be. And that's where those that don't follow the Lord Jesus, that's where they go. It's our duty, Christian, to forgive those that sin against us because God has forgiven us so much. So much. And it's also a sobering thing to think about. I need to tell others about the Lord. Eternal damnation will be upon those who do not trust in the Lord. And that's what God has saved us from. Amen? That's what the Lord has saved us from, Russell. I'm, 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 I'm bringing this plane down to a landing. You could come on up, son. You come on up, man. We, we've been saved by the grace of God. We've been forgiven by God of so much. Love is our responsibility, church. Love is our responsibility. We don't want to cause another brother or sister to sin, to, to fall into sin or to make them stray away from the Lord in any way. And we need to forgive. Love. Love. Love one another, but also love the world. Love one another. We, we're, 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 God has blessed us in so many ways as a, as a church, crown and joy. If there's any fractions amongst us, go to that brother and sister. Love them. Because we've been forgiven of so much. We've been forgiven of so much. There may be you hearing this message today and you never received the love of God through Jesus Christ and been forgiven of your sin and you don't know what forgiveness is like, I implore you today, trust in the Lord Jesus. The sinless Son of God lived perfectly. He was tempted in every way because like he said, temptation is sure to come. He was tempted in every way when he lived this life. And he never sinned. He was God in the flesh. Came down, lived perfectly. Died on the cross for the sins of his people. And rose again three days later. He's calling you today. Repent. Turn from your sin. And put your faith in Jesus today. He will forgive you of all sin. Amen? Amen. He will forgive you of all sin. Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us of all sin, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away and nailing it to the cross, having disarmed the powers and authorities He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Church, we've been forgiven of so much. We've been forgiven of so much. Again, forgive your brothers and sisters. Forgive those who sin against you. It's hard, yes, but we have the power of the cross. We have the power of God in us. And if... There's a brother or sister in, in, in sin. We need to go to that brother or sister and rebuke them in love. And say, brother, sister, this is not the way of the Lord. Turn, repent. And God will restore that brother or sister. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. 
Father, I pray that you um, just have your way in our hearts, Lord. God, I pray for those that don't know you today, Lord. I pray that they come to know you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you draw them to Jesus, give them repentance and faith in the cross and the resurrection, and help us as a body, help us as a church to forgive and love one another and love this world and tell them about the goodness of Jesus. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we pray that you just birth it in us and help us to live it, Jesus. Help us to not just hear it, but live it and do it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.